Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast. I am Jessica, and I will be your host today um, for this really fun book, um, which is, man, it is like such a unique take on everything. Um, (laughs) It's got dogs' voices. It's got like a story going on in the background that deals with grief and, you know, just sort of like life changes and I just thought it was super uh super fun and super interesting um please write a novel in letters J. Wynne Russick yes and glad to be here welcome so why don't you tell us a little bit first of all tell us a little bit about yourself and then I want to just kind of chat about how this idea kind of came together because it was a really um different and unique way of exploring the topics you explored in it, in the book. Okay, well, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a theater critic by profession. Uh, I spent 23 years at the Baltimore Sun as its theater critic. I reviewed uh, more than 3,000 plays in that period of time. I got to interview just about everyone I could have ever wanted to interview, including Stephen Sondheim and Andrew Lloyd Webber and, oh, Tony Curtis and Richard Chamberlain and Cary Grant and all kinds of people. Um, uh, One of my favorite stories, however, was interviewing the dog that played uh, Sandy in a national tour of of Annie. And the dog had an understudy, or as they called it, the underdog. So that was a favorite story. And another, I did a series for three years. I covered the path that the musical Hairspray took from John Waters' movie all the way to the Broadway stage. And of course, you don't have a more Baltimore subject or character than Hairspray. So that was that was a great deal of fun. And I took a buyout from the Baltimore Sun in 2007. And a week before I left, I got a call from WYPR, which is Baltimore's NPR affiliate, asking me if I would like to review plays on the air. And I have been doing that ever since. In fact, I did that today, right before we started this interview. Um, And I've done a lot of other things, a lot of teaching in particular in inner city schools uh, where arts um, programs are being cut uh, terribly. Uh, So I've done a lot of that. I've taught on a college level from, from kids to senior citizens during this time off. But one of the most uh, useful things um, and happiest things I did. The first academic year that I was no longer at the Sun, uh, I got to be a visiting student in Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Paula Vogel's graduate playwriting program at Brown University. And that was just a wonderful experience. And it very, very much informed the way that I wrote Please Write. I don't think it would be the book that it is now if I hadn't, for example, had the freedom to do what she calls making the strange familiar and making the familiar strange. I love that. And I feel like that's extremely appropriate for this book because again, we're we're talking like as as the reader, you're like, okay, I'm reading these conversations between these dogs. Um and when you start sort of seeing what's going on with the humans through their eyes, you start to recognize, or at least I started to recognize what was going on, but sort of, um, it was like through like a dog, I don't want to say a dog's (laughs) eye lens, like almost like, you know, like the the working mind of the dog and how the dog is going to interpret um, really what's going on with Pamela and Frank and, you know, their situation and their family. And it was just like, like one minute you have like one of the, you know, talking about like, I why can't I be on the couch? And the next minute you're recognizing something really uh, monumental that's happening in Pamela's life. Um, 
So I have to ask you, are you a dog person yourself? And could you, do you think a dog person, yeah. Do you think a dog I, person could not have written this book? Because <laughs> written this book? Because I, well, think- I, I want to go back a minute, if it's okay, and sort of like the setup of the book, since um, you mentioned some of the characters. So yes. this is an epistolary novel. It's written entirely in letters. There are three correspondents. Two of those correspondents are dogs. Uh, So there you have dogs are very familiar. Letters are very familiar. Dogs typing letters, not very familiar, (laughs) rather strange. The dogs are uh, Winslow, who's a noble, sophisticated, very literate Boston Terrier, and Zippy, a puppy, a terrier mix, kind of a ragamuffin wild child who's rescued off the streets of Baltimore. And they are corresponding with a character called Grandma Vivian, who is an artist in Cleveland. And there are three secondary characters that the correspondence correspondence often write about. Um, Two of them are the dog's owners, whom you just mentioned, uh, Pamela and Frank. And their marriage is unraveling, and that's chronicled by the dogs. And the third character is Pamela's mother, who is facing increasing health crises as the book goes on. So despite what I hope is a lot of humor in the letters that the dogs write, particularly Zippy, who has um, a rather slow learning curve when it comes to learning to read and to type, um, the book is ultimately delivering a distinctive account of coping with heartbreak and loss through the power of imagination and love. So it's it has a very serious underpinning and it's also the reason that the publisher says that he believes the book is is geared ideally to people who are 16 and older. But to answer your question about my history with dogs, which goes back almost before I was born because my father was a dog judge. That was a uh, his hobby, his lifelong hobby. His older brother wrote the first book about Boston Terriers in the United States. Uh, That was back in 1926. And uh, my parents had a very great show dog right before I was born. And they were so concerned that this dog would be jealous of the baby. Usually it would be the other way around, but they were so worried about the dog that they got a handler for the dog who showed this dog in North and South America for three years, the first three years of my life until they thought I was mature enough to live with a dog. And I've often kidded and said that my parents only had me because they couldn't find another dog that they particularly liked at the time. Um, So I I did grow up with dogs, mostly Boston Terriers, but other breeds as well. And that has continued, of course, into my adult life. And I'm a a huge dog fan. I find that if I just see a dog on the street with, you know, getting walked by its owner, it makes me smile. I love it. I love it so much. Um, Yeah, just uh, for, for real, you know. Uh, you got a lot of that in it and you put you, you put some of that into the story um, as well. Um, you know, I, I also I have to ask, like. When you were writing this, did you pull in any of your experience being a theater critic or writing for for um, for that? Was there any part of that that sort of informs your writing of um, this? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, As I'm sure you noticed, the character of Pamela is a theater critic. What an amazing coincidence that is. And so some of what she is doing for her job does work into the book. And uh, for example, there's a section of the book where um, it looks like Zippy is going to go into show business. Zippy might have a Broadway career. She doesn't really know what that means, Um, but she gets very excited about just about everything. And uh, there's several playwrights mentioned in the book. Shakespeare is mentioned in the book. Um, Zippy has um, kind of an affinity for Shakespeare. A taste for Shakespeare would be the better way to put that. Edward Albee figures into the book. Um, the musical Annie, which which I mentioned before, um, also called the musical Annie Get Your Gun. Um, little excited Zippy gets those two musicals very mixed up, which I hope provides some of the humor. So uh, yes, that definitely did figure in. And people have said to me that they find the letters, which I hope are written in very distinct voices for each of the three correspondents, that they find the letters a little bit like uh, dialogue in a play. 
And if that's the case, then, um, you know, three decades of reviewing plays has sort of fed into that. Yeah, I was going to say you did, de it definitely did feel uh, very conversational and a lot like just sort of that um, punchy dialogue that you get on stage. Um, how did you, like, how did you manage to make Zippy and um, Winston and uh, Vivian, how did you manage to make everybody's voice so distinct? And I, another thing I, I guess I have to ask, because you do come from a family that, that knows dogs, did you uh, sort of observe different dogs that you felt would be both Zippy and Winston when you were, you know, kind of coming up with them, writing their dialogue? Absolutely. I mean, I think most novelist characters are composites of one kind or another, and these dogs are as well. And um, one of the things that was, I, I would actually sort of hear the voices or, or, or sort of see the letters in my head beforehand. And there were certain things um, that were just little rules that I made for myself. Vivian very rarely uses contractions in her letters. And uh, Winslow has a very large vocabulary. He's a very formal dog and he writes in a very formal manner. So this is the very first letter in the book and Winslow is writing to Grandma Vivian. In theater, they say it's a good idea for a play to start on the day when something very different and unusual happens. And that is what Winslow is writing about. I wanna say one other thing before I read this. So there is an audio book of, of Please Write and it was recorded by a wonderful actress named Nancy uh, Lulipala. And she really gets three different voices for these characters. And I was very concerned about how she would handle Zippy's letters because initially when Zippy is learning to type, her paw is just going on every key on the keyboard and it's just total nonsense. And she found a way to do that and to show Zippy growing up and learning to write. And she does things like um, when song titles are mentioned in the letters, she will sing the song title, which is, is really quite lovely. Um, so I can't, I'm, I'm not an actress. <laughs> um, I, I can't quite get that flavor into, into my letter reading, but uh, I will try to get a little bit of Winslow's formality into this opening letter. Dear Grandma Vivian, you know I only write if something is amiss. With considerable dismay, I must inform you, there is another dog in the house. Frank brought home a puppy. Why? This is a perfectly contented one dog household. The puppy arrived here dirty and shivering in the small hours. Pamela and I were asleep when Frank came into the bedroom, turned on the light and deposited the muddy pup on the bed. Pamela sat up none too happy and told Frank to get the puppy off the bed and out of the bedroom. And what was he doing staying out until this hour? And where was he? And we cannot keep that puppy. And some other things I didn't catch because I followed Frank and the puppy out of the room. Frank gave the pup a bath in the basement wash tub. It wouldn't stop whining and whimpering. At one point it jumped out of the tub and shook dirty bath water all over me. The indignity. Pamela and Frank need to locate its owners soon. So that's a bit of Winslow. The urgency of it is just so like, it's so perfect. And you re I mean, you really just kind of like get his voice. And I have to say, like, would you, are, are you open to um, a passage from the others as well? Oh, sure. Um, uh, because I think that like one of the things that's so great about this book is um, and it's so funny because I rarely do um, have we rarely do have readings on here. But I feel like in order to just, you know, like entice the listeners, like they have to hear the different voices and just kind of <laughs> how fun and funny they are to just sort of get what they're getting into, because it's it, it really it really was uh, like I said, it was it really did feel like just really fresh, distinct dialogue. That was so much fun. Well, I'd be happy to do that. I can. The very next letter is Grandma Vivian's response, and she is a very calm. Um, she's the voice of reason and rational thinking. And most importantly, um, the voice the voice of um, 
of, of complete unconditional love. Uh, so she's very, very supportive. And she has that grandmother's thing of, you know, the grandchildren, the grand puppies can do no wrong. So here is her response. Um, this letter is dated Cleveland Heights, Ohio, Thursday, November 1st, 1990. And by the way, I set this book in the early 90s because I wanted it to be before email and texting took over. It was, I could sort of go along with the dogs learning to read and to type, partly because I have them doing this by reading the newspapers that are spread on the floor for housebreaking the puppies. Um, but yeah, having, having, um, uh, having them using texting and emailing and texting and emailing uh, are, are very different forms from letters. Um, as I'm sure you're more than aware as a librarian, the importance of letters. So here is, here is Grandma Vivian's response. Dear Zippy, my first letter to you, Winslow and I have corresponded for some time and he wrote to me about your arrival. What a tough time you've had, cowering wet and cold under a parked pretzel truck in a rainstorm. And what a relief to be bundled into a warm car and taken to a warm home. I am so glad to have the picture of you that Pamela sent, even if it is on a flyer that says, did you lose this dog? I realize the flyer probably upset you. Rest assured, you have nothing to worry about. I promise. Although Pamela printed lots of these flyers, I would bet that the rest of them are at the bottom of a trash can. Pamela gave them to Frank to post around the neighborhood. But remember, it was Frank who found you and brought you home. He has your best interests at heart. So that's a bit of, that's a bit of um, Grandma Vivian. And then you said you wanted to hear a bit of Zippy too? I think that, yeah, I think that, um, that, that, that was super, uh, Zippy was super fun to read. <laughs> well, this is a little, this is probably about halfway in when she actually is writing sentences and, and, uh, and words and it's legible. And since we were talking about um, the musical Annie and the dog Sandy, um, I will read a letter about that. As the book goes on, um, Frank begins giving Zippy a whole bunch of titles and jobs. For example, um, when he has a cold, she rests in the bed with him and he calls her his nursing terrier. In this case, uh, she's trying to help Pamela with her research, her theater critics research. And so Frank has dubbed Zippy uh, Pamela's research assistant. So this is, uh, as you'll see, this is about Annie. Dear Grandma Vivian, Zippy is also working. Zippy is Pamela's A number one research assistant. Zippy is researching Annie. Annie has a dog named Sandy. Sandy is a rescue dog like Zippy. Pamela has a toy Sandy dog. Pamela said it is for photo shoot. Zippy remembers Annie has a gun. Don't shoot Sandy dog. Zippy rescued Sandy dog, ran around the house with it, showed it the house, ran upstairs, ran downstairs, saved toy dog. Pamela gave Zippy a biscuit to drop toy dog. Nothing more said about shooting dog. A good day of research. Love, Zippy. <laughs> I like that, you know, it's very much because I have, um, I have eight year olds and there's sort of like when they're just kind of starting to learn how to write, there is just that whole like very, um, you know, like choppy sort of way that they describe things going on. And I like it coming from a dog as well, <laughs> especially a puppy, because uh, puppies, puppies are very uh, distinct in their distractibility. So you can't yes, yeah, very, very short well. attention span. Yes, extremely. Um, so yeah, no, I think that, and you you already at, um, answered my question just kind of about um, why you set the book in the time period that you did. Um, but I I guess like one of the one of the things that I kind of um, wanted to know if there was like a main theme in this book, just sort of like something central at the core that you wanted people to sort of take away from it. What would it be? It really is coping with loss and how imagination, and particularly dogs, can help with that. And um, the book has a, a blurb on the back um, by a funeral director. And I actually, there have been uh, several advanced reviews that talk about this and I have gotten comments. Um, one of the ones that moved me the most was a little review 
talking about how um, this particular reader wished she could share this book with her mother and that it sort of brought her mother back to her. And that's so much what I'm trying to do. I, I have these characters who I think really help Pamela. And I'm hoping that that example, the way they help Pamela get through grief and hardship is something that can help readers as well. I think so too. And, you know, like I said, like there's just a lot of humor in here, but you do kind of get the underlying of grief just as the story goes on. And I think one thing um, that I certainly took away from it and also from my own experience is that um, grief is sort of, it, it's sort of, it's individual and it's universal at the same time. Um, and you know, while everybody sort of experiences it in their own way, there are notes that you pick up on that, you know, if you share, you, you can sort of help each other heal. And, um, and I think that there was a lot of that in this book and, you know, just framed through the eyes of dogs kind of added that whimsy and joy that I don't think you often get in books that sort of deal with topics like this. And um, it was just lovely. So I want to thank you so much for, first of all, for reading, because that was fun <laughs> um, in your voice. And then also just kind of sharing these characters and this, what feels like a very personal experience with people, with readers. Thank you. Thank you. That's really what I was going for. And it means a lot to me that you got that out of the book. Um, and then, of course, the book has all these little components. It has recipes. There are about a half a dozen recipes, all all tested uh, and, and tried by neighborhood dogs and my own dog, Juno. Um, it has the start of a children's book. Um, it has a lot of greeting cards in it. Uh, so there, there are even a few illustrations. So um, I hope that uh, I hope that all of that uh, sort of whimsy, as you put it, I love that word. Um, one reviewer described the book as a waggish tale, and I thought, oh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so I, I hope love puns. I love puns so much. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was great. Um, and I certainly hope that listeners check this book out. Um, it's a good gift book. Oh, yes. I think, I think so. I, it's a good gift book, and it's a good book for dogs and just people who just sort of um, need, I guess, a little, um, a little warm hug in book four. Ah, oh, what a wonderful description. Thank you so much. Thank you. So once again, this was Syosset Libraries. Turn the Page podcast. This is Jessica. Our guest today was Jay Wynn Russick. And we are going to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.